Good evening and welcome to the uh, January 22nd, 2018 Board of Selectmen's meeting. Please uh, join me in a salute to the flag. I pledge I allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll open the meeting with a public hearing pursuant to RSA 31 colon 95 dash B, Roman numeral, uh, Roman numeral 3A, and we're opening that at 701, and it's uh, for the purpose of complying with the provisions of RSA 31 dash 95 dash B, Roman numeral 3A for the following, and it's to accept and expend unanticipated monies in the amounts of $10,000 or more from the following in 2018. And they're all listed on the agenda, so I'm not going to read them all because it's a fairly lengthy uh, list. you agree to that? The board agrees, absolutely. And, and this is something you do every year, um, and this is an authorization to allow our uh, departments to pursue known grants and that's what the long list is and if they are they, they to be able to pursue and apply but if it were to be uh, accepted and granted they would have to return to the board for further approval okay does anybody on the board want me to read the whole negative thing? sir no. okay fine then we'll close that public hearing anybody wishing to be heard anybody from the public wishing to be heard sorry all right, we will close that public hearing at 7.02, and we'll open up the second public hearing pursuant to RSA 41 colon 14-A, Proceedings for 109-111 Kings Highway Tax Map 197, Lot 18. Three provisions of the deed from the town for which relief is requested are in paragraph 4, specifically the one single family dwelling unit with no, the no subdivision restriction and the seven-foot setback requirements. There are two dwellings on the lot that have been in existence since 1945 and 1955, respectively, which are proposed to be placed under the condominium form of ownership and fewer than seven feet from lot lines. Second hearing. Is there anybody from the public wishing to be heard on this? Seeing none, we'll go to the board. I'm good, Mr. Chairman. Sir. Rick? I, I wish that it uh, stated exactly how big this lot is. I mean, we, we can have that answer for you before you take action. This is the second public comment period. Then it returns to the board for action, and we can certainly have yeah, that information. It would be interesting to know just what the dimensions of this lot is. It has three uh, – I mean, that doesn't tell anybody anything. Anybody else? Negative, sir. Okay. If it's under a 5,000-square-foot lot, I would be s certainly against it. Okay. We'll have that information? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, no – Open to public again? Nope, nobody. Okay, close that hearing at 7.04. And at 7.04, open public hearing pursuant to RSA 41 colon 14-A, proceedings for 971 Ocean Boulevard tax. 871, sir. 871 Ocean Boulevard tax map 183, lot 17, remove the single-family deed restriction, second hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. My name is Tim Phoenix. I'm an attorney from Hopeful Phoenix, Gormley and Roberts in Portsmouth. I'm here tonight with and on behalf of Dr. Fred Erig, client and personal friend. Uh, this is the second uh, selectman's hearing, the fourth hearing overall. Um, we were here uh, a couple of weeks ago and went through it. It was pretty quick. Um, Conservation Commission took five minutes. Planning Board took eight minutes uh, to approve it. Uh, what we have is a, uh, a deed restriction again in, in uh, uh, paragraph four of the deed. Um, it's been noticed as uh, a request to lift the single-family dwelling uh, uh, restriction, uh, but as I pointed out last time, we'd also like a, uh, to lift the uh, four-bedroom restriction. Um, you can see uh, up on the board that I, the easel wasn't here, so it's hard to see. I've got the floor plan at the top left, and that pink uh, out outlined area is a room that's identified as a bedroom, although it has no closet. So I would decide to be conservative. There's three be marked bedrooms on that floor and two on the first floor. Since the restriction is for four bedrooms 
and I wasn't sure whether that one without a closet should be called a bedroom. We'd also like the restriction lifted on that. Um, Dr. Eric bought the property in, I keep asking, 2013? 2013. Um, the documents we submitted show that in 1984 it was leased property. It had the same restrictions. Uh, a building permit was uh, issued to a guy by the name of Kajianis to put a second floor on. The building permit says it's for two rooms and a bathroom. Uh, we don't know exactly when. I'm assuming it was right around then, 85, that it became a two-family um, with full you know, bedrooms, kitchen, bathrooms, living room on each floor. Um, it's stayed that way uh, since approximately 85. Fred bought it that way, um, so we're asking um, for the restrictions to be lifted. Um, also, I've submitted uh, that we found there's approximately 20 um, uh, structures between 3rd and 19th that are multifamily of some kind. I sent one of my associates down to check the records, and many of them have no files. We couldn't figure out how they got to be multifamily, um, where most of them are subject to these same deed restrictions that the whole area was under. Um, whether they were granted variances or were in existence prior to 1952, which is when the, the zoning ordinance changed to prohibit the multifamily to family, uh, we don't know. But um, there are many, many down in that area that we've been able to find. You can see the photographs at the bottom uh, left. That's Fred's house. Um, it doesn't really look like a, a two-family, uh, but it is. It's been the same way for what we believe is 30 years. We think the deed restriction makes no sense. Um, as a side um, note, there is also a, a restriction in the original deed for the seven feet. Many of them had that you couldn't be uh, less than seven feet from a lot line. This on the plan was six and a half feet. The original um, deed out had, a, had an exception that said it's seven feet except what exists today, and that hasn't changed. So it's about six and a half feet from the right, line, right side line if you're facing it from the ocean. Um, there was no public comment, no objection from anybody or anybody in the public at the uh, Conservation Commission, none from the planning board or the public at the planning board, and nothing, no objections from the select board um, or the public at the last selectman's hearing. So we're asking that, that um, those two deed restrictions be lifted, which are uh, limited to single-family dwelling and limited to four bedrooms. Thank you. Anybody? Uh, if I may, can yep. I just have to clarify one question? Sure. So uh, conservation and planning both commented to the board. I just want to be clear mm -hmm. on what it is. The conservation indicated you want deed restriction four, correct? Deed restriction four. And as I understand it, that might include single-family dwelling, no more than four bedrooms, no more than two-car garage. Is that we, the list of the entire thing you're asking We for? only have a two-car garage, so we don't need that lifted. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Anybody from the public wishing to be heard on this? Oh, and for Same. Selectman Griffin, it's a 5,206-square-foot lot. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anybody from the board? I ask, uh, what, what is the um, the, the uh, rule about? I thought if it was a uh, without a bedroom, without a closet, it's not a bedroom. That's th what I've always thought in the past. I assume that's why you pointed out there is no closet. Right, there is no so closet. It really should um, only be a three for, bedroom. For septic purposes in the state of New Hampshire, most most communities say if it doesn't have a bedroom, it's it's. I mean, it doesn't have a closet. It's not a bedroom, even though you could put beds in it. Um, the uh, engineers and surveyors that did the uh, floor plan for Fred listed it as a bedroom. I wanted to be safe. I think he would commit not to put a closet in it. Um, but just in case, we thought it makes more sense to just say, can you lift it, the restriction, because that's the situation is not going to change. As well, it Hampton it. has some type of a – it's either they count the bedrooms or they count the bathrooms. I'm not sure what it was, but when there was a uh, – uh, what do you <coughs> call it, where they wouldn't allow any building – um, moratorium. A moratorium for many years. I can't remember if it was the bedrooms that was the moratorium or was it the bathrooms. But I've always heard here that if there's no closet, it's not a bedroom. Okay. We can I'll check, check the that. building to ensure that by the time you take action at the end. Okay. Anybody else on the board wishing to be heard? No? Okay. So if I might ask, what's yep. the procedure from here? We close this hearing. We go two weeks. And then the third hearing takes place, and we vote at okay. the third hearing. Okay, good. And then there's some document we can prepare for recording, if, assuming you grant it that we record, and I work that out with Mark. Correct. Right. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we'll close the uh, that public hearing at 710. We'll open up uh, public hearing number four at 710.
public hearing pursuant to RSA 41 colon 14 dash A proceedings for 1088 Ocean Boulevard tax map 99 lot 11. The only provisions of the deed from the town for which relief is requested are the seven foot restriction in paragraph four to allow units two, eight, and nine, including their decks and existing utility panel to remain at their current locations and allow the subdivision of the lot A large house from the, and to allow the subdivision of the lot A large house from the remaining land on which units two and nine are located. The unit foundations are 6.42, 6.52, and 5.14 feet distances from the property lines. And in some cases, the decks are even closer. Both the units and the decks are shown on the site plan, and lot A is shown on the subdivision plan. There are no neighboring buildings close enough to be affected by this as shown on the plan. The encroachments onto town property are proposed to be removed. Second hearing. <coughs> Anybody from the public here wishing to be heard? I'd like to ask, yeah. you know, are these going to go before the voters? Uh, I believe gonna... once you, what, it goes, but this one, as I understand it, will go back to the planning board for action after you. But like, for instance, the one that we were talking about before, is that going to go before the voters to de lift the deed restrictions? I don't think so, I but I'll, I'll have to or... defer to Mark when he comes down later on that issue. Okay. Yeah. I don't think so. I think okay. that's why it's before you. Well, I think it's important, that question about the bedrooms, then, because that has always been uh, something that's a okay. complete okay. deed restriction. Anybody uh, anybody else on the board wishing to? All right. So no, this no, on this property, I want to just make sure that uh, the encroachments are taken back. I mean, yeah, there, there is this property in particular. I know Mark will have something to say at your final hearing. Both Planning Board and ConCom have said yes, but there is an issue that Planning is going to need to deal with because one of those buildings encroaches, and we understand it on state land, not on town, but on state land, and there's some adjustment issues they've been working on on that. So, more this is the fall one that was the motel. Yeah, mm -hmm. Split, mm -hmm. splitting it, and yeah. one, it's just a tiny portion of one sticks out beyond the lot land. And Mark will have some more information for you on the final night before, before you take action. Okay, uh, so we'll close that hearing at 7:13. And we're now on to public comment period. Anybody from the public wishing to be heard during public comment? Please uh, identify yourself. How do you know me? Wait, I know that, but everybody doesn't. Everybody knows me. Timothy Citizen Jones, 16 Dustin Avenue. The moratorium was on the bathrooms. You're right, uh, Rick, on that point. <coughs> and bathroom, our bedrooms do require at least one closet. You're right on that as well. <clears throat> but I'm here to speak about the uh, Governor's Beach Forum that took place last week. I found the Hampton Union front page article entitled Town versus State to place unhealthful emphasis on personalities in conflict, in short, providing more heat than light. The emphasis should be on the Governor's statements that provided more light than heat. He revealed his willingness to personally engage in resolving the issues. This is an opportunity we have been seeking for years to negotiate with the state as a whole, as only a governor can. The Board of Selectmen should be congratulated, all of you, for providing the inducement to bring about this opportunity. Let's make the most of it. The Board should delay filing the lawsuit to demonstrate our good faith effort and provide time to establish the framework for negotiating with the governor. A letter to the governor should be sent to reflect the sentiment. The delay should also allow the candidates in our town election to take a stand on the issue, thus giving the voters some voice on the matter. The immediate filing has no advantage to the town, but does have the disadvantage of losing the opportunity the governor revealed. Delaying the lawsuit has no downside to the town but a real possible upside. The Board of Selectmen has produced an historic opportunity brought about by the threat of a lawsuit and the governor's philosophy of engaging locally. Let us reach out and try to accept the olive branch the governor appears to offer. Let's not surrender or squander this historic opportunity created by you by stridently filing a lawsuit without being circumspect about the governor's outreach to us. 
Thank you. Anybody else in the public wishing to be heard? Yeah, I have, I have comments as state rep, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Governor of the state of New Hampshire should apologize for his attack on Martin Luther King Day on the town of Hampton, New Hampshire. Some of us called it chicanery, a cheap shot, a backstab, or media blitz. He attempted to impugn the legitimacy of local government. He insulted the citizens of the town of Hampton, New Hampshire. He attempted to make a mockery of the statutory authority of the Board of Selectmen. And he attempted to act as a selectman, a judge, and a jury. The morning of the so-called meeting, Max Sullivan called me and queried whether I had a position that Mr. Waddell, who voted against the tort, was rightfully engaged to speak with the governor. And I informed Max that I had no comment and I wished not to politicize the governor's presence in town. That same morning, I called the governor's office and I spoke with Elliot, th wishing to thank the governor for his appearance in Hampton and further to inform him that I would be performing duties as a state rep and as a selectman about the most important matter in the seacoast of New Hampshire, if not New Hampshire, which is the seacoast cancer cluster, the deaths of children, and our water supply, where I was in attendance at the Portsmouth City Council. The governor was aware of this. The governor came down to this meeting, and he put on a dog and pony and falsely asked for my name when he knew that I was in attendance at the Portsmouth City Council doing the citizen's work on Martin Luther King Day. I would say to the governor as a rep, I would say to the governor as a citizen, I would say to the governor as a selectman that we are not intimidated by his abusive power or any political dynasty in the town of Hampton. I've had these same discussions with the majority leader for the New Hampshire House, the GOP chair, myriad legislators. Tomorrow I will meet and have this exact same conversation with the Speaker of the House, Chandler. There are many Americans and many, many Hamptonians that have served their country in far greater peril, in far greater hardship than any political dynasty or Governor Sununu's family. I want to speak about Captain Falcone, that felt the Falcone Circle in this town is named after. He's a Hampton native, he was a Marine, he was commissioned in the Army, and he was eviscerated on a ridge line in Vietnam in 1964. His granddaughter is Mrs. Robbie Bean. His grand great grandchildren are Vera and Bo Bean. They live in former Senator Preston's home on Winnicott Road, State Senator Bob Preston. I would speak as a former Marine officer, I would speak for Bo and Vera and Kayla. And as reported in the Hampton Union, the next time Governor Sununu comes to this state, nobody in this town wants to hear him whining about his government service and that he's not getting home for dinner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Announcements and community calendar. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bridal. Just said uh, the chamber is having their annual meeting and retirement party for Doc Noel on February 8th. Uh, if people would like information, more information, uh, give the chamber a call or uh, check their website. Okay. And uh, Mr. Griffin. Yes. I would also like to address as announcements uh, that I personally do find it very hard to understand after being here for 14 years on the Board of Selectmen, I have never seen a governor or any state official call a meeting at the very last minute and not give notice to the board. Uh, I've seen them this year call different meetings they've had and have them on Monday night when we're actually meeting. So, I mean, I just don't understand why this is happening. I got the emails when I was out of the country having planned my vacation over a year ago and what am I, you know, although I might have even tried to get out of and lost my $10,000 so I could have a say. Uh, and I took it as an affront. I don't know if he's talking about me or Phil because I wasn't there. But uh, just because he lives one town away, he could come over here anytime he wants. I can understand why 
why the employees that work um, uh, for the different DOT or whoever, why they can't meet because we have a quorum and they don't, and they ha can't make decisions. But I think the governor probably can make a decision. And I think for him to call a visit like this at the last minute, I mean, in Hampton, it's always been considered that if you have a meeting in January or February when nobody's around, that you're trying to pull something fast. That's the way it's always been all 55 years that I've lived here. And to me, you know, yeah, a lot of people showed up because of the flooding and stuff. And I applaud him for coming. I applaud him. Uh, I think I'm the first one that mentioned it when, right after he was elected. He, he, uh, when there was an article about the lawsuit that was in the newspaper, he stated way back then, at the very end of uh, one of the articles in the Hampton Union, that um, he was in favor of something happening. And I brought that up here at this table. And now he still feels the same way. But at the last Hampton Area Commission, where I've been on it for, this is my 10th year uh, being there, I was attacked personally by every person there except the state employees and with the exception of Chuck Rage also. He said, yeah, we have to all work together. And I feel like we all have to work together. But I sat there and took a hit from every one of the other people, starting with Bobby Preston. Uh, we are the ones that have put our name up and run for office. And I have been elected five times and I have won. I've run unopposed numerous times. And I've come in first and beat by a large majority. And I have a lot of support. And I'm here to represent the people. And I find it outrageous that there would be a meeting without a prior notice, that he can just call up at the last minute. Uh, even Craig Benson would show up and uh, come to the Board of Selectmen's meeting. The, uh, and then to sit there and let John Nyan um, make all his comments when he's not an elected official. He was the chairman of the Hampton Area Commission. And that night, he stated that he was stepping down because he could no longer take the direction of the Board of Selectmen, which we, as a Board of Selectmen, and everyone sitting here knows it, never once gave him any, um, any direction. And then he turns around, and I hear he's getting paid $80,000 for the job that he's got. And that's why he stepped down to become president of the Chamber of Commerce. It's ridiculous. And to me, the, I have been the biggest supporter of all business people all 14 years that I've been here. I've fought for the trash and everything else for them. I've done everything I could for the business community as well as everyone else. I've tried to make it very balanced. And as being here this many years, <clears throat> I have learned how you do have to balance it, but we elected officials are here to uh, represent the citizens of Hampton. And for him to be sitting there, and he gave a lot more respect to the Hampton Village District, which is wonderful. But you know, essentially, the Hampton Village District is in charge of um, entertainment, the fireworks. We here set the policies for the town of Hampton, both in Hampton Beach and here. And I, yeah, I think it's great that the governor comes out with some, hopefully, what he'll be able to do, because it is his responsibility and the federal government's responsibility <coughs> to do something about this flooding that's happening. There's very little, really, that I think the town can do, although I think the town, if people vote for this warrant article that's out there, we need to figure out what can be done and what can we offer uh, help them get financing to raise their houses or whatever has to be done. But, uh, th uh, and then I hear that um, Mr. Uh, Sal, that has the new owner of the casino, he finally shows up after six years, having been invited by the Hampton Beach Area Commission for at least 12 months in a row, never showed up for one meeting, never accepted anything, he did accept, I think, twice, and his mother passed away, and I don't blame him for not being there that night, but then he accepted again, and he didn't come up. Yeah, I think he was there. I think he wants to get some public funding, like they're getting at the Mount Washington Hotel, like they're getting at the Balsams. But we here in Hampton need to get some of the money back that we deserve. And, you know, I, I think I've brought on for talking for 14 years about the problems with the drainage 
I think a lot of people have misconstrued that I was complaining about the flooding. I haven't been. I'm only complaining about the drains that do not work. And they haven't worked for more than 10 years. I've owned my property for 55 years, and it's only been the last 10 to 12 years that I cannot use my front door because uh, whenever it only takes a, a downpour, granted it does eventually go away after 20 minutes, but I can't have my clients getting sprayed down by cars. And uh, it's not just my clients either. It's all the people that are tourists that are walking up and down the road. They have to, they have to, I see baby carriages all the time in the fast lane trying to get around the puddle or uh, just going through the puddle. It's ridiculous. The lady that lives next door to me, I don't have the damage that she has. She's 82 years old and now she'd like to sell her house. And I think it's a crime that that woman is going to, when she does sell, and or her children sell after she passes on that she's not going to get what she has coming to her after owning that house for over 30 years people don't like to complain it's our responsibility here at this table to stand up for the taxpayers and the taxpayers of hampton are not being dealt with fairly and i think the governor realizes that and i think now he realizes with this flooding that just happened I definitely would have stayed home for the meeting if I would have known that I would needed to watch my property too, uh, but that just wasn't the case, you know. Um, and I would always be there if I possibly could. But for him to drop a, a, a thing like this at the last minute, and for John Nyan, who's with the Chamber of Commerce, to get up there and get to say whatever he wants, and even the Hampton <laughs> Village District, when the Board of Selectmen doesn't even get invited. They just drop a notice at the last moment. They make no communications. They never try to talk to Fred. And I feel that somebody either, I hope it isn't at this table, but somebody, whether it's on the Hampton Area Commission, somebody invited him to come down there knowing that there weren't going to be a lot of selectmen there. And I think that's wrong. And I can't prove it, but I think it's a cheap shot. I think it obviously was a media blitz and I, to me, it's just wrong. I'd like to see him come here and address us, treat us like normal. We, he's missing his dinner with his kids. What does he think happens here? We don't even get dinner every Monday night for 14 years. And let me tell you, it's not just one meeting that we all put in. And we spent a lot of time preparing, and I don't think we're given um, the respect that we should. And I'd like to say to everybody at the Hampton Area Commission that f was so down on the fact that we would even bring up this conversation, at least he has shown some interest. So that alone proves it's right. And that same sentiment is voiced in the editorial that's in the Hampton Union today. And um, I don't know, I, I think if this is just something that shouldn't be, and before they start dishing out money to the uh, Mount Washington Hotel, the balsams, I would love to see the casino get money, but I'd like to see them get it after we get our share. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'd like to announce and just say that it's really uh, important. Are we going around the board before you speak, Mr. Chairman? We did. Uh, no, no, I haven't spoken well, yet. I'm sorry. I apologize. I apologize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You may speak. Uh, thank you. I've, I've spoken uh, as a uh, rep at public comment. Uh, this, uh, this meeting was a hit job. I echo uh, Selectman uh, Griffin's remarks. Uh, there's uh, those self-professed people in this town, uh, the self-proclaimed I work behind the scenes. Uh, Senator Stiles, former Senator Stiles, approached the selectman on this board and was directly involved with the selectman on this board, interfering with the negotiation of labor practice and uh, wished to offer her terms on exactly what limited uh, length of contract we were offered to the town manager. Uh, there are others on this board that were instrumental in this, this hit job on the town, this hit job on me personally. And uh, I'm going to uh, take the, at least some of the time to explain the facts, as I've explained to the chairman that I would. Uh, I am on the uh, State Parks Advisory Council for the state of New Hampshire, in addition to the Seacoast Pollution uh, uh, Investigation Commission, where I was the night, as the governor well knew, about the most salient and exigent issue in this town. And he played his little dog and pony, where is Phil Bean act. On January 12th, the only written documentation to this board, the only written documentation to the town manager, 
to the selectmen, to the town attorney, came from Phil Bryce, directed to me and other members of the advisory council. It's January 12th, 2018. It's a Friday at 4.51. Usually when you send out something Friday, close to 5 o'clock. It's kind of like when bad news happens in Washington. You release it then, and people don't pick up the email, perhaps, or they lose it. I get hundreds and hundreds of emails in my business as a state rep and as a public servant here in Hampton. Dear council members, Governor Sununu will be hosting a public forum at Hampton Beach to discuss investments by the state into the beach. That was the title. The governor was going to come down here, and he was going to discuss investments by the state into the beach. Now, I don't know who talks professionally like you're going to talk about investments by the state into the beach, but it sounds like something if I was at Winnicott High School in a sophomore, my teacher would send it back and say, what does that mean? Now, that's the only, only con confirmation that there was a meeting that was coming to this board. Mr. Sullivan will back that up. Mr. Welch will back that up. And if there's another board member that had written information that the governor was coming to speak about something that they termed investments by the state into the beach. Furthermore, upon the governor's attack on this town and my personal attack that I suffered by the governor, and that's the lesser. I'm not worried about that. I'm a big boy. I can take, I can take an attack. Uh, I signed up for the, the big bucks here, the uh, $200 a year and the 3000 here. I sent an email to Mr. Welch, and I asked, this was uh, Tuesday night, after Max Sullivan told me while I was serving the state in my town and the Portsmouth City Council about a much more important matter, cancer in the water and children dying in water supply. I asked if there were any written communications to the town of Hampton from the governor and from the state of New Hampshire regarding this meeting. The answer was no. I asked about the gen genesis of this meeting to Mr. Welch, the town manager. Mr. Welch replied today, I have no idea. I was not told. This is a $26 million corporation. This is the town of Hampton. The governor is a politician, and he acted like a politician in this meeting. I asked about negotiations. Was there any discussion of that by the governor or anybody from Concord? No, we were just asked, asked to be present. So responded the town manager today. When was the entire board notified? Now, this is important when we're talking about there's a tort action. This is important about when, the, when any elected official, one of 50 in the nation, comes to town. When are we officially notified, Mr. Chairman? The town manager informed me today, Jamie told you and I told each board member when I saw them. Now, let me tell you right now, there's about 9 million appointments that we, we keep as people that work for a living, Mr. Chairman, people that represent the town of Hampton and Concord, and people that are selectmen here. Okay. I asked further, if any state representatives or senators were notified by the governor's office or any state boards, committees, commissions were notified. The only notification we got was this different meeting, this public hearing on investments by the state into the beach. Nothing about the governor's agenda items. So the meeting's taped and available. And I would say this course of action the governor's grandstanding, and he has no ability to spend money in Concord. The, governor's, the governorship is a very powerless position in this state. The governor's council has to approve any expenditure over $5,000. He can't appoint anybody as a commissioner without the governor's, uh, the governor's uh, council approval. He can't pass a law, and he has to pass a budget through the House and the Senate. Now getting on to the paper here that came through here. And I agree with Rick 100%. And, and, and uh, to, you know, we, we signed up for this. We can take it. But, you know, they had their play. They were very deceptive about this meeting. It was a hit job. It was advertised by nobody, went out by the state council, and nobody in this town, including the town manager, uh, was notified what it was going to be about. But I guarantee there are some people in this town that knew exactly what was going to happen at this meeting. And I guarantee they talked about it. But they're not subject to the right to the know like we are the right to know law. See, they talk to the governor, and they have his telephone number, and they set up meetings like this, and then we have to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And this is the exact same reason why this tort must go forward, because you can't trust these people, and they operate in a duplicitous manner, and they make promises, and they break them, and we have thousands of taxpayers that pay their $5,000 a year, 
and we have employees that don't get contracts and they get shorted. Now, in the Portsmouth Herald edition, governor comes to Hampton to prevent lawsuit against state beach over cost, over, over beach cost. Nobody's had, a, nobody's had an inkling in this, this corporation about what's going on, but Phil Bryce says that it's going to be to discuss the investments by the state into the beach. The governor calls it his A-team. Well, I don't call it the A-team. I don't know what I call it, but I certainly don't call it the A-team. The governor said his goal was to bring the necessary parties together to discuss what led to the selectman's vote in September. Now, if the governor wants to have a meeting about something, he better schedule it, and he better have an agenda. And if the town of Hampton and the chairman is going to accept the meeting, then he better know what the agenda is about. And he better have the details, and we better be informed. And if we think we're going to agree, at least on my watch, uh, and, and, and negotiate with people like this, uh, you got the wrong guy. And you might have the wrong board of selectmen if they change that vote. And if they do go and change that vote, ask them which, which 2,000 taxpayers have to pay their tax bill and not receive any benefit from it. I'd like to thank Max and the Seacoast Media Group for their excellent reporting on this because they, they allowed us to, to provide some feedback like this. And then we have Hampton Beach Area Commission John Nyan. Now, I, I don't know what John does, but the Hampton Beach Area Commission doesn't run this town, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and Hampton Beach Chamber of Commerce doesn't run this commission, Mr. Chairman. And I guarantee that Mr. Nyan in the governor's office spoke before this meeting on the agenda. And I didn't know anything about it, and you didn't know anything about it, or maybe you did. Let's not, let's not or maybe, maybe, did. maybe, let's not maybe you did. did maybe did you know. had your chance to talk, Mr. Yeah, Jim, and I have mine. Yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah, well, you're totally. getting, you're getting a little, totally. no, leave you out of it. You're, you're part of the problem. Was there an agenda? Uh, be careful. I hear there wasn't an agenda. Wait, wait, let, let, let him finish. Be careful what you say, real careful. You. Real careful. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I'm not going to accept your threats. I've been threatened by the governor. You're small fish in this potato. Okay? Okay? <laughs> what a fool. You're a very small fish. I've what heard lots of names. I've heard, this is the governor. I've heard lots of names attached to this potential lawsuit that apparently didn't even show up tonight. This is after the governor's office was informed about this issue. This is how he treats a state rep. This is how he treats a citizen. This is how he treats a selectman in this town. Regina Barnes, Selectman Barnes, she stuck up, says, I didn't like the fact that the governor was able to say that. Selectman Griffin, I appreciate your support about this circus that has suddenly transpired. Going further, town versus the state. The governor had productive and engaging discussions and received positive feedback for his stacked audience. Governor Sununu, again playing selectman, remains, con un remains convinced that his unnecessary lawsuit is no more than a waste of Hampton's taxpayers' dollars. It's out of his wheelhouse. This is the town of Hampton. The governor doesn't decide what this board does. The governor doesn't decide what we spend for taxes. The governor's job is in Concord. He said he was appalled by Bean's absence of the meeting, considering Bean's advocacy for the suit. You get sandbagged on the purpose of this meeting. You're not told what the purpose of this meeting is. I fully disclose where I was. I was at the Portsmouth City Council, and I get sandbagged like this. It's not about me. It's about who the people of Hampton rep who elect to represent them. And this is the disrespect that the governor of New Hampshire treats elected Hampton officials like. Bean said he didn't attend the meeting because he attended the Portsmouth City Council meeting to speak on matters related to his work on a task force. It is not a task force. It is a commission, and it's a cancer cluster investigation commission because there are dead children, and Lydia's parents and Sam's parents have testified in Concord, and there have been tears, and this is one of 300 in the nation. You'll hear later on when the town manager is asked about our ability and our confidence to supply water to this town. Governor hasn't done a thing about it. Governor insults me when I'm going to protect the interests of this municipality to run his town. His town, it's a revenue camp for $200 million a year. And he's done nothing. He, won't, he has not asked the town manager about this. I doubt he's asked any select board member about it. But when you do, go and do the government's work, you're keel hauled and you're backstabbed and you're disrespected. And that's to the town of Hampton. 
I think it speaks clearly to the legitimacy of the complaints being filed here. So the government, the governor, is talking about the legitimacy of this vote. There were four votes against, or four votes for this tort. And His Excellency is talking about the legitimacy of this vote. So now he's passing judgment on the Board of Selectmen in Hampton, a sovereign town. There was one vote for it, and that was the chairman's, or, or to oppose it. Now he's talking about the legitimacy of a duly elected board in the state of New Hampshire, the town of Hampton, the United States of America. That's bullying. And if you think you can negotiate with people like this, with this lack of, this, this lack of, of equanimity and equality, you're wrong. Selectman Rick Griffin defended Bean and called Sununu's mark a cheap shot. It's wrong to say it's very telling that board members are not available to his last minute's media list. Continuing on, this might, this might punch a little hole in the governor's A-team concept. It was a terrible accident down at the beach several years ago, and it was adjudicated, and it went to court, and this is also in the Portsmouth Herald. Victim and young driver's crash awarded $9 million. The governor's A-team was part of the approval of the design down there, and this is a local, local family. And they're known to generations of people in this town. And out of that $9 million, the contractor in the state of New Hampshire are responsible for 70% of it. Now, by the same right these people had to go to court and have their day, so must the people of Hampton. And I wonder if His Excellency got involved in the, in the, the car crash in the $9 million award. And I wonder if the governor called those people and held a meeting. And I wonder if the governor called the judge. And I wonder if he said that these victims of this crash don't have a right, Mr. Chairman, don't have a right to go to court. And it's wrong to go to court. And they don't have a right for this. And I want to talk about what Mr. Harris said about the legal system. And that was the attorney. The attorney for the plaintiff. We are gratified that the jury recognized the harms and losses that were suffered. That's what our system is designed to do. And we really do believe that justice was done in this case. And that's all we're simply asking for. We don't ask to be attacked. We don't ask to be deceived. We don't ask for chemifleurs. We don't ask for deception. We don't ask for people to hold a meeting and then come in with a stacked deck with all of the people that work behind the scenes and then offer character assassinations to lowly paid, hardworking public servants, and then think that we're going to negotiate with them and receive any justice. And I would say to the town of Hampton, and I would say to the governor, as I will say to the speaker tomorrow very briefly, that this fiasco in this circus is prima facie evidence that this must be heard by a judge, just as this board has determined, and just as the Seacoast me Media Group has rightly opined, and just as everybody that I've talked to in town thinks, except for the people that were probably part, and I'm being very careful, Mr. Chairman, who arranged this meeting that suddenly morphed into uh, calling me out and calling me appalling mm -hmm. and uh, trying to change the deck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome. Mr. Chairman, yeah, I was just going to um, ask. Quickly? I, yeah, it's very quick. I just wanted to thank Regina for the comments that she did okay. have. And I wanted to thank Nancy Stiles because, you know, I wasn't here just before my okay. vacation because I was had a very trying time at the hospital. Uh, I, I came here to make sure that Nancy Stiles was appointed. And I have a lot yes. of faith in Nancy. Thank you. But yes. I would like to point oh, out I'm sorry. that... Um, they talk about the investments, the $12.5 million. Well, here at the board, all at the beginning when I first started, the biggest thing we did was to invest $12 million, and we have to pay interest on it, by the way, and the citizens of Hampton have been paying a lot more. So the citizens of Hampton have invested much more than the states even thought and I, about. I will say, Mr. Griffin, that that was brought up at the meeting, 
I said that. Well, good. And Thank I you. and I I will tell you that Thank too. You. I I did try to get in touch, but for some reason my emails and I talked to Fred about it today. They weren't okay. done. I even sent the uh, comments that Max put in the newspaper yep. from Bangkok. Okay. So I was trying to be a part of this conversation, Thank you. but the town Thank email you. didn't work. Yes. Correct. Um, I just want to say yes. The chairman did right. Actually, right in the very beginning, you did explain that. That's how right. The t town did almost match. Well, maybe even more, invest in order for the state to do that work. But I just wanted to tell everyone one thing. I 100% agreed with what Selectman Bean and what Selectman Griffin had just said. That meeting was stacked. It was stacked against the town. It was stacked against the citizens of this town, and it was stacked against the Board of Selectmen. I went to it because I was under the impression that it was going to be about, you know, ways we can work together to invest, and in the state invested in Hampton Beach. I thought it was very positive that the governor was going to be there. And immediately, when certain people began talking, I knew what the meeting was, what the agenda of the meeting was. Whether or not there was a written agenda or not, I'm not sure of. But I it made me not. very uncomfortable as a selectman. And I purposely spoke on an issue that didn't have anything to do with the suit because that's not a public forum, is not the setting that you discuss a uh, pending litigation suit in. And I also wanted to add with something that Selectman uh, Bean said that I was the Selectman that was approached by the former Senator and uh, was requested that I note that I do not renew Fred's contract, which I understand everyone has their right to give input. I'm a Selectman. I'm an elected official. I was elected by this town the same way that the five of us sitting here were, and I was elected by the people, and the only reason I did this job was for the town of Hampton. And I want to make that very clear. The only reason I am doing this job is for the town of Hampton and for every single person in business that live here. And I'm new, and I'm learning. I don't have the 14 or 15 years experience, but when I walked into that room and those people started talking, I'll tell you right now, something is up and something stinks. And I am 100% behind this lawsuit, and I am not backing down from it, and I want everyone to know that. You do not pull someone aside and have them meet you in a s different town and tell them after you know that they've only been a public elected official for 18 months, tell them to fire their town manager. You don't do that. It's wrong. That's all I have to say. Okay. Now I can speak. I'm not going to politicize this at all. I think what Citizen Jones said was absolutely correct. I think it's time to step back and take a look and see if something can be done. And I'm not so rude that I walked out when somebody talked. That just shows a lot of thin-skinned people. I was up at the State House last uh, Thursday, made a special trip there. I was up working at Waterville Valley, made a special trip to the State House to be there for two bills that would benefit Hampton on rooms and meals taxes. The only people there were the state representatives Cushion, Edgar, Emmerich, and Nancy Stiles and myself. And both of these bills had to do with rooms and meals taxes, which would benefit Hampton, which I hear an awful lot about, and it's at the legislative level that that's going to be dealt with. I was surprised. I was surprised to look at the sponsors on the bills. Well, some of us have to work during the day. That's fine. The, so can't go to Congress. fine. You could... I am uh, just making the comment that it would be good for people to support these things, but I, do, I don't think this should be politicized. I think the governor came down. It was an ill-conceived meeting. It was called too quickly. He might have stacked the uh, deck, but the fact of the matter who is... to stack it is what I want to know, when, and somebody did. Wait a minute. We know who did that. When, I have a feeling, too. I cannot guarantee that anybody spoke about, to anybody about anything, but I can guarantee one thing people that I spoke with What's this meeting about? Why are they having this meeting? Who called it? I can guarantee you that, but I can't guarantee, as other people on this board can, what people are talking about who they don't even talk to. So that's good. I can't point fingers at anybody, and I don't point fingers at people and say that, hey, maybe you're doing this or maybe you're doing that, or you're the problem. I don't do that. I don't hyperbolize everything and blow it way out of proportion. This shouldn't be politicized. It's an opening. It's an opportunity. Save the people of Hampton the money of going to court. 
our legal department's out of control on the on the cost of outside point counsel. of order so that's go oh, stop so. point of order it's that's the, now, now we're throwing the legal guns. department out of the point bus point of order you just talked about a whole bunch now, of people now you're throwing the t legal department out of the bus and Great. i think i didn't throw the legal department out of the bus i said the budget's way out this. look the at it want this they look want at us to fight Jim, i'll be the first to say i think you did a good job and i'd like to say that sincerely Thank and you. I, I appreciate it. And that. I saw the emails from Nancy Stiles. She asked everyone that's on the Hampton Area Commission just to sit and absorb what was being said. But I, that's not what, well, I guess John's not on it anymore. Well, he's I the just, Chamber of Commerce. He's not even elected. Let's official. not talk about people. Yeah, that totally confuses me why he's not talking. Ourselves. That is so Fine. wrong. But I think Citizen Jones had a very, very good point. Let's not politicize it. Let's drop all the he fighting about it. He has a really it. good history. Uh, yeah, but we'll he had a good advice. point on this one. I don't agree with him on a lot of things. He had a very good point. Let's see what we can do to get out of this, If get what we need. That's it. The town of Hampton want their share of money. Before I agree 100 percent. I agree 100 uh, percent. These private concerns. I agree 100 percent. By the town, Rick means the people that live here and the businesses. That I agree 100 percent. And I'm We're 100%. going to get back to order in the meeting, please. We're finished with the announcements. Let's go on to the consent calendar. Thank you very much. Two Third Street Map Two Two Three Lot Twenty Two New Land Lease. I'll make. Make the motion. Second. second. All in favor. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Appointments. Robert Landry, uh, NHDOT, New Hampshire Department of Transportation. Underwood Bridge update on the interim repair and discussion of uh, closure dates. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, since the last time I was here in October, we have actually gone out to bid with the project. SPS New England was the low bidder. We're hoping to get it approved on Wednesday's meeting, January 24th, at the Governor Executive Council meeting. Um, the new cup one that are coming are scheduled for January 31st, which is good, a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, we had a pre-construction meeting with SPS pending their um, approval of the contract. They're looking to begin on February 19th. The one thing and the reason, the major reason we're back is during the bidding process, we were basically informed by the contractor that no machine shop would guarantee our previous hope of 14 day closure of the bridge. Um, or that's probably said wrong. Let's say that again. 14 days necessary to complete the work where the bridge bascule would be in, in operation. Um, they were saying they couldn't be guaranteed less than three weeks. So in turn, we revised the schedule to 28-day um, operation of the bridge closure. I sent out emails to the list of boat owners, etc., that I had been in contact with earlier. Um, basically received emails back, or one email back, that as long as the bridge was operational from a bascule sense by March 30th. They would be fine with the additional closure dates. Um, with that, we are looking to complete the work by March 19th with, so that the bascule would open and the final completion would be April 6th. Wanted to bring that back. I was hoping some of them would be here tonight. I'm not sure if there is or isn't. I uh, think they could provide input on such. Can I just clarify yeah, one thing sure. for the public that you're talking about the bridge when it's closure. That's to boat traffic, not to vehicle traffic. Correct? Right. It's the bascules right. unoperational in that, and boats can go through. We just can't, can't open the bridge for it. Just trying to be clear to folks. No, nope, that's very good. All. Good point. The board, anybody? I think so long as you, you're you working with the fishermen and they know about it, I mean, they, they obviously realize it's got to be fixed. So... I would, I would hope that, you know, if, if they had a problem, they'd come to you, and it sounds like you've tried to reach out to them, and uh, hopefully you guys will continue to do that and work with them. That's all. Yep. Rick? Yeah, I'd like to say that, because you've heard some com conversation tonight about DOT and other members of uh, that work to, for the state, and you all do a great job, and I respect the way that even at the Hampton Area Commission, the guys that are there, they, they never get involved in Hampton politics. And I, I think that you're doing a good job. You're being very fair. And uh, I thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
So, brief synopsis. What's, what's wrong with the bridge? During the summer, and oh, and I'll get specific dates so I don't. And take your time. Nope. On July 11th, the shaft coupling failed. Um, I wish, this is when I wish I had the slideshow up. On July 12th and 13th, we did emergency repairs by our bridge maintenance forces. And basically what that repair is, and I can show you if it's all right. Since this is the coupler that failed mm -hmm. inside the lifting. These are the guys in there working. That's the specific coupler, of course. This is the actual repair they did. They welded the plate on there temporarily, put some pins in, and that was all a temporary fix. So what we're going to do this time is we have new couplers coming, two of them. They need to take this shaft out, send it to machine shop, re-mill re the coupler and the shaft so they fit inside the coupler, and away we go. Got it. And then how about the, aside from that, that failure, what, what, what about the condition of the bridge besides that? Is there an assessment on that bridge? Yeah, it's, it's our number one red list bridge in the state, and that's due to the condition of the bridge. Um, we have a project in the 10-year plan that's been moved up a year to 2023 um, that we're going to start getting together with a public advisory group as we discussed the last time, trying to bring that forth and find the right solution. Okay. So when we, you just heard uh, our, um, our very friendly discussion about mm -hmm. investment at the state. Um, it's the number one red list bridge in the state. Correct. Okay. So does that mean it's in the worst condition? No, that the priority ranking is based on conditions a piece of it. Importance is another big piece of it. Um, length of detour around it. Uh, volume of traffic. Uh, size of the bridge. Because the bigger the bridges are, the more investment it takes to repair them on a square foot cost. And it's also currently... It's one of our four movable bridges that we have in the state. Got it. What is uh, uh, the operational risk management threat that that bridge, by virtue of its uh, degraded state, if you would allow, <clears throat> um, could be permanently disabled for a week, two weeks, ten days in the summer, if you can say that at all? Uh, we have bridge maintenance crews just like this one here that will come out do the best they can to get it back open as quick as possible. Okay. We understand the importance. Does the town of Hampton have a, uh, uh, a detailed uh, inspected report uh, on that bridge? They should. Okay. They should. Are you aware if we have one or not? Uh, I'm not aware off the top of my head if we have one. Okay, Generally, great. Generally, they send down their do. reports. I can for update us, yeah. it. And they, send, it they send the reports yeah. consistently. I'm sure it's up there. They, I just can't say I've Through I've the seen years, it. They keep, they've sent yeah. them yeah. over and over again. Right. And, and for those of you that were at the, uh, the meeting, while I was in Portsmouth, uh, was that was that discussed at all? An investment in the beach, the number one red listed beach uh, bridge, or was it just no? It was not. Okay. I would. I might. I think the bridge was, bridge was. briefly it was. discussed. Okay. More about moving it up on the plan and having some discussions about when it's to be replaced. Okay. Not in any great detail, however. Well, how can you move it up if it's already number one? Uh, it just there was a brief no, discussion about no, when it gets replaced. Move it up as far as in the Timing. program. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh. The funding went from 2024 to 2023. Oh, that's interesting. And, and, and how much is the um, the uh, the bid with SPS? With SPS, four hundred and thirty-two thousand dollars and eighty. Gotcha. Four thirty-two eighty. Gotcha. Eight. Um, thank you very much for your service to the state and your uh, getting away from your supper hour from your family tonight. I appreciate it. It's basically a, a fix, a quick fix to right. the, to get us to twenty twenty three. Yeah. Yep. I have a question. What's the po probability? That it could go beyond the time. Is there a probability? You know, you've got you've set that time that it's going to take to repair it. Beyond 2023. No, no. The, uh, this repair here. What's the probability that it could go beyond that and not be able to be opened? And at what point during the repair would you be able to let the fishermen know and the boaters know whether it's going to be possible to get it open on the date that you say you're going to get it open? They. One of the things that we do with a construction project like that, there will be a list. Um, Nikki Hunter is the district construction engineer. She's 
the, the thought for this area. She's had a lot of the big bridges around here, or her staff underneath her. And um, I can't remember. Kevin Wynn will be our construction administrator, our contract administrator. He will be there, and he'll be in constant contact with everybody, including Gino and his, his people, too. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Yep. There's no Thank other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Diana Martin, Recreation and Parks Department, Departmental Update. She loves a good discussion. Good evening. Hi, everyone. Hey, Ben. All right, so I'll, I'm going to try and condense my stuff so I can get home to my dog. I haven't seen him in a week. <laughs> so um, for our, for our um, parks part of our department, we can do it our general maintenance and everything like that, but above and beyond the general maintenance to the buildings and the fields and stuff, our parks crew, with the help of the USS Hampton and Mike Edgar, um, they built four sets of bleachers for the parks, huge bleachers. They're really nice, and um, they're going to look great in the parks next summer. They also built six picnic tables. They've taken down all the Christmas decorations except for the snowflakes <coughs> will be coming down this Thursday. And uh, I don't know if you've seen our office lately, but it's a disaster right now because we just got all new brand new furniture to replace the stuff that was left over from when this was a bank. So right now our office is under construction, but the parks guys have been putting together all of our furniture for us. So. You're doing it's a great job at it. <laughs> Looks good. Yeah, I'd like to get some of that stuff out of my office so I can actually walk to my desk. Um, in the parking lots, Vic DeMarco and his crew did a great job again this year. Um, it's nothing really to report on that right now, except that we are taking, um, we'll be advertising those positions soon, but we're taking applications now. And last year we made about five hundred thousand dollars in the lot, so we did. We had a great sum, great year, even though the summer had was very weird weather this past summer. In the recreational programs, um, we're gearing up for all of our summer activities. Believe it or not, already um, we had one of our best camp years last year, and our K through two sports program is underway right now. Our Senior Citizen Club had a great holiday luncheon um, just before Christmas, the turkey dinner that we um, had with Wilbur's and the um, St. James Lodge. We had a New York City day trip on November 19th. We have, this is one I want to talk about, we've set up a trip to Disney on Ice, uh, Dream Big, starring Tinkerbell, telling the Disney tales on ice. So that trip is this Friday night, January 26th at... Um, SNHU Arena in Manchester, and we still have tickets for that if people are interested. Men's basketball has started, and it's running through the school year. We've got ongoing programs for the seniors right now that we're, we're taking registration for or drop in, which is bingo, bone builders, bridge, Hampton walkers, the yoga classes that we have going, and also the senior citizen club. Uh, our local league, which is our high school rec hoop, is up and running. We've implemented all of our holiday events already, the tree lighting, the Christmas parade, everything went off great this year. And we also had our tour of lights that was full at all the trips that we took around to see the lights in town. And then on Christmas vacation, we had um, a children's camp, which was called Exhibits on the Go, which included Christmas rocks and six bricks Lego, which was super fun. And it's kind of a um, sort of a side STEM type program. So. We're hoping to get more children for that in the next few months as new programs arise in the same category. We also had a New England Patriots trip this year, which hopefully we'll be able to get another one this year coming up. We've set up two trips to the Boston Flower and Sh Garden Show in March, March 14th and 15th. We've set up our first trip to the Red Sox. This trip is at Yankee Stadium against the Yankees on Saturday, June 30th. We've set up a Kids in Action class at Marston School, Age Children, which includes class themes, gym games, art activities, etc. And we have three sessions of that. We also set up a Creative Kids Art and Play class for grades K through 2, and we have uh, three sessions of that. We've set up some yoga classes for adults through Bar Fitness, which we ran in October and November, and we have now set up another for beginners that started on January 10th, so we'll continue with that. And we also started yoga and nutrition class with Bar Fitness. That also started January, that's January 19th. 
And last but not least, we've set up a trip to Piketty Place in Mason, New Hampshire for April 11th. And this is a five-course gourmet luncheon trip with an entree portion to choose from of either shaved ribeye or gorse and crostini or ratatouille over fettuccine. That is all I have for tonight. We've been very busy and we've got a lot more to set up. So next time I come in to talk to you, I'm sure I'll have a lot more stuff to tell you. Questions from the board? Thanks for the report. Thanks for all you do for the... Uh, children and the seniors of the town thank you good report a lot doing as you said a lot going on with the seniors which is really good yep. especially this time of year a lot of them have a hard time getting out so I know. yeah so, Rick, good. how does it go Ribeye. at Piketty Place does that usually sell out or do you get a lot of yeah, what is Piketty Place yeah it's a uh, it's a little, nice little restaurant that's uh, what, what, what's it's the a store? restaurant and herb farm. Yeah, and they um, have luncheons there, and they use all herbs from their own. But garden. there's a famous story that started from there. What yeah. is it? It's it's not Little Red Riding Hood, but it's something, it's something like that. Something similar to that. Yeah, yeah you're that right. has a, and it has a lot of history, and it's a nice yeah. little place. It's always surprised me <laughs> that it's kept its level of success after all these years. Well, their menus are, like every month they have a different menu that you can choose one or two options. And Renee did a really good job choosing this one because I think it can't be beat, but it's, this is always a good trip. People always like going there for yeah. a special event. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've done another good job, but what about your dog? Why don't you get to see your dog? I was on vacation last week, so he oh. was being babysat. <laughs> yeah, I didn't get to see mine either, and I didn't like it, but no. dogs are important. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Mr. Bean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, great job. Thank you. And uh, do you have a dancing program in the town? Dancing? Yeah, like different dance. Yeah, there was a woman at the galley hatch that, that uh, worked there, and she came up to me, and she's a dance instructor. And I told her to get in touch with you. She certainly should, because we have had, over the years, we've had, um, we had someone that taught belly dancing. We had someone that did hula, uh, Hawaiian dancing. And we also used to have line dancing, um, but we haven't had any of those in quite a while. So yeah, I, I think I, I forget it, but I will, I will inquire and, and and told her to link up with you. And then in, in, in the recreation department, in uh, Superintendent Murphy has been uh, so excellent in that new project about the, the community orientation. Do you envision using some of that new uh, junior high space for some of your activities? Absolutely, I was on that committee. Well, That's wonderful. Can you share? I know you got to get back to your dog, but just uh, <laughs> That's okay. sh share a little bit about that. What, what that going to present to the town of Hampton? Well, um, hopefully, hopefully <clears throat> that if if it comes out the way that we are all hoping that it would, there'll be a lock off so that we'll be able to use that facility at the same time that school is in session. So we'll be able to um, have activities with the seniors is who I'm really focused on, but it will be for everybody, but the seniors especially will have a place to go. And, you know, because the library has been great to us over all these years, but that facility is very small. And a lot, it's not handicap accessible, so it's hard to um, get everybody involved that needs, that would like to be involved. So I'm, I'm visioning that we'll have a place where we can store some of our stuff where we can keep some stuff set up tables set up that the seniors will be able to come and go and they'll have an easy parking area right there too as well wonderful thank you director thank you mr chairman i noticed that the um when i was on my cruise <coughs> that, that line dancing is still very popular people like it both older people <coughs> and young people yeah yeah so it's good exercise um, for older I think people the reason that we didn't have line by lane dancing stop was our instructor moved away and we couldn't find a new instructor at the time so we you good at it Rick no god trust <laughs> me. that's the same song it's I just changed the name way. a couple of times but you should have saw how people jump up for it it's amazing that. thank you all right you do a good Thanks. job good night. good night approval of minutes January 8th 2018 so moved second all in favor no, you're oh, I'm sorry. Two no, I'm and uh, no. against, abstain. Two. Two. Yep. Very good. Uh, town manager's report, please. Good evening. I'm in pinch hitting for Mr. Welch today, who unfortunately had to go home, not feeling well, which never happens. Uh, so we wish him well. Um, Public Works has done the tree pickup, um, and they primarily did it, but it got. Um, bogged down with some of the weather that is going on so if your tree was not picked up public works says just give them a call and they'll send somebody out to pick it up there are still some around town 
Uh, they got the vast majority of them during pickups, but some of it got delayed based on weather, uh, but they're open to the call. A uh, deliberative session for the 2018 town meeting will be held in the auditorium of Winnicott High School starting at 8.30 a.m. on Saturday, February 3rd, 2018. <coughs> uh, manager wishes to pass on a thank you to everyone who helped us during the slow, snow clearance days by moving vehicles and trash recycling containers off of the roadways. Your help was greatly appreciated by our snow crews, who I would add anecdotal did a tremendous job. Uh, property owners who are eligible for elderly and veterans disability and other exemptions are reminded they must file for those exemptions with the assessing office before April 1st. Be happy to answer any questions the board might have, Mr. Chairman. I just want to thank Public Works for always cleaning up after these snowstorms and getting out there right away and making the town look great again. And Mr. Town Manager, I just have one question because I've received a couple emails about it. On there is a hazard mitigation grant program, and I guess some people are asking whether or not Hampton would be eligible for that. So there's, I think there's two parts to that question. The first is I've seen an email string go around, and we've received some calls. So the hazard mitigation program that that email talked about um, globally, um, that program that folks think we're eligible for, we are not. Short answer is based on this last storm, individuals who suffered damage are not eligible based on uh, the declaration. In order for a process for this hazard mitigation program to take place, there must be a storm that causes damage. There must then be a certain amount of damage so the state can apply to the federal government for a disaster declaration. This past storm in Hampton, while we had damage, it didn't reach those thresholds. So no declaration was pursued or is going to be. Anyone who suffered damage as a result of that storm is advised to contact their insurance uh, providers for it. That begs the second question of what programs are available. I have been in touch with uh, Homeland Security, uh, the person in charge of grants and the director. We're going to have a meeting next week where we're going to, what I, what I want to do is work on this information. There used to be a number of programs available to folks, a repetitive loss, and this is an issue we are experiencing and we're going to continue. So I've been in touch with them to try and figure out what programs can our folks individually apply for. And there's a whole myriad of federal programs. We're going to try and identify those that might work here. We'll work with Homeland Security first, and then my hope is to come back to the board and to schedule a, a public meeting or a public information session where we can sit down, have these folks come back, and answer questions. Okay? Thank you very much. All right. Rusty, all set. Thank you. Yeah. I would just like to say that uh, I left on New Year's Day and put my Christmas tree out New Year's Day right on Ocean Boulevard. It's still there. So we can, like I said, we can, we'll let them know. I was know. surprised it didn't float away. <laughs> yeah. I took, uh, mine, I took mine myself. In fact, I'm thinking it might have taken root. That's what it's starting to look like. Well, you could be like the lady who apparently took it back to, uh, you know, 10 days after the first of the year, took it back to the place she bought it and asked for a refund. So. <laughs> we'll come down and pick up so I can get it for you, Rick. I, I have a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, water. Yes, sir. Uh, we've got two issues with Coakley, and that's that's next up on the agenda. And I specifically um, am interested in um, the quality, uh, not the quality, the quantity, as it relates to our two wells that are shut down. I know that wasn't discussed when the governor was in town. I was up uh, doing our people's work for it, and I fully informed the board and the governor's office about it. Um, Give us, give us the quick and dirty on that, the threat, um, our, our ability to supply, and then we'll talk about Coakley and some of these other issues. Please, sir. Sure. So there's, as you know, there's been much discussion on this, and we've engaged with Aquarian uh, on a number of uh, fronts. Uh, we'll go back to a, a report I'll talk about that they gave to us in July of 2017 that talked about that issue of supply and demand. As you recall, that really came from discussions about uh, their advocacy to put on a new well. Um, and in they, they did an analysis or had an analysis completed with projected peak demands. Generally, the peak demand day is in July. And what did our water, uh, what was that supply? Essentially, their report came back and indicated that the, the margin of safety, that is the range of what their wells can produce against that maximum uh, daily amount that we, we would need to do, had a slim 2% safety margin, meaning there was risk that they might not be able to produce enough water for the peak demands. 
Now, what's important to note on that, that the industry standard is, is they reported a 15 percent safety margin. Again, we were operating many times at a 2 percent. In looking at that data, they made assumptions about growth. They made assumptions about our demand, um, and that's what guided their decision. Since that report, we've had two wells taken offline, well 6 and well 14. Well 6 is a high-producing well. Um, it produces a substantial, not the highest, but it's probably one of the, I think, top two or three wells that produce for them. So clearly, by taking that well offline and anecdotally through conversations I've had with folks uh, representing Aquarian, um, there's going to be a need for well 6 to go back online to meet the demands that we will have. That answer what you're looking for? It, yeah, it, it does, and it, it highlights, Mr. Chairman, um, Sometimes uh, the, the priorities uh, of sudden onset of leadership in municipal platforms, and it could be a snowstorm one day, uh, but today the threat uh, of not meeting quantity demands is a serious, serious issue in this town. And that is exacerbated by the Coakley landfill threat that cannot be disproved that has potential carcinogens and has resulted in well shut down that would place us with zero threshold to meet demand in the middle of the summer. Has the governor ever talked to you or Mr. Welch about that? He hasn't spoken to me. I can't speak to Mr. Welch, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, I'll, I will leave that to you and Mr. Welch uh, and perhaps the board uh, to make a phone call to the governor uh, about that. and. Uh, uh, this summer is yesterday in terms of strategic and tactical execution of municipal platforms. And uh, we're literally, uh, who knows what the weather, uh, just months away um, from being mobbed and not being able to meet demand. And I think the governor of the state of New Hampshire should be alerted to this. And I think this board has a responsibility to its citizens. I know this board has a responsibility to its citizens to advise the governor that um, – based on your comments right now, that we are far off traditional standards of a 15 percent safety margin, that with this well shut down, um, we have no safety margin, and that we are producing uh, millions of gallons of effluent every single day in the middle of summer with a full beach, and we may not be able to do it. And uh, we would like some command attention uh, from the state to be involved with that. And uh, while, while this issue of... Uh, uh, revenue and cost at the beach is, is significant and has already been voted on by this board. This is something that uh, the state has expressed no interest in. None. Zero. Nada. And we'll get to Coakley and we'll get to the, 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 the quality issue in a minute. Um, and then these wells that are coming back on uh, produce how many millions of gallons of water now that we're not using, we're not tapping Six into? Six and 14. Uh, the numbers, to my recollection, are well six produces somewhere in the order of three hundred million. Okay, I'm not going to hold it to you. Yeah, yeah. One's like yep. three hundred on the ratings they do. Whether it's MGD, it's not MGD. It's there per hour. One's three hundred. One's one hundred. The one hundred is on the very low end of their scale. The three hundred is on the upper end of their scale of production. And again, as I've said, I've been approached in. There's the belief of the meet our peak demands. Well six, which is one currently closed down for concerns of the PSC involvements. Uh, will need to be put back online in order to meet demand. And I, and I would just say this, Mr. Chairman, and defer to um, um, Selectman Barnes in a second, is I, I would appreciate her quarterbacking with you, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, uh, our chief executives and assistant chief executive, uh, integration and strategic and tactical planning with the governor uh, about this issue because it is uh, clearly um, a crisis issue, and uh, we can't let uh, events dictate uh, our operations here, and it's it's been neglected by the state, and uh, it's a huge issue. And I know we're going to come back to Coakley, but I'll defer to the water. Well, I just so have a concern about well six, which was turned off because of the PFC contamination. Now we need that well in the summertime, right? So what? To meet demand, I believe that's what they indicate. Yes. Right. So, <laughs> what are we going to do here? We're going to turn it back on and. I, uh, I will have to hear from them, but my, right. well, my see, this is, is yes. Sorry to interrupt you. I didn't mean to do that. But this is the point. Like, this stuff just gets ignored. The reason why it gets ignored is because when you ignore something, you don't have to deal with it. Well, guess what? Now it's all blowing up. So what are we going to do? Are we going to clean the well? Is Coakley going to clean the well for us? Because they should if they're polluting it. 
so that we can serve our customers and our residents in the summertime, what's going to happen? Who's going to help us decide? It's, kids, it's not something that can be done by one single town. So, <coughs> good, turn well, back, turn well 6 back on. I hope you fix the problem with the PFCs that they have in there before you do that. I would just like to say one thing and point out it's an interesting fact, and I don't know if Regina knows about it, but it is being the water uh, guru. Have you heard about what's happening in Cape Town, Africa, South Africa? So, They're running out of water. By August eight, by April 20th, there will be no more water. They're right now um, only give each person 25 gallons, and that's to do everything, drink, wash clothes, take showers and they're actually running out of water. They, they should have started building these desalination uh, plants right. earlier, but they're going to just be out of water. That's why All it has to be done federally. Stopping. The biggest problem is because of the tourism that they're going to lose, because that's where everyone makes all their money there. Uh, last week at the public hearing on the sewer treatment plant, on the bond, Yes. Dick Nichols gave me some... Uh, he made some comments and he gave me the uh, thing and I gave it to Fred to make comments, uh, to make, uh, to, uh, Copy. to make copies and hand out to whoever was necessary to get it to. Did Fred do that to yeah, you? Yeah, my belief is they went to DPW who's responded to those issues. There was another gentleman, Mr. Zanoy and okay. Mr. Nichols. I believe they've both been responded to, but I'll confirm okay, that. Okay, because I had an email today from Dick Nichols asking I'll follow if, up he, on that. If, if they had even been given out. So could you follow yeah, up on I'm, that, please? I'm fairly certain that they were, but I'll follow up and let you know. Okay, very good. Anything else for the town manager? Yeah, I, was, I wasn't done, Mr. Chairman. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, that's fine, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking at the Units Hill uh, data here. Is that going to be scheduled? Are, are you prepared to talk about that tonight? The Units Hill data. Units Hill, the plans, the $1 million plan, the $7 million plan. The... I am not prepared to talk about that tonight. Okay, all right. Um, I, would, I would request that, uh, that that get put up on the radar and be an agenda item um, sooner uh, than later. That's... Uh, all of those options. They started a million, is that correct? And they they go, go up to, to seven. seven or eight million dollars. So um, <clears throat> that's something we paid uh, quite a bit of money for. That was a warrant. I, I want that uh, um, to have some visibility. I don't have any visibility on the hard work and good work and the great work that um, the chairman just referenced with uh, Mr. Nichols mm -hmm. and Mr. Zanoy. I'd like to, uh, the full board, if I may, um, to be brought up to speed on that. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay. Anybody else for the town manager? All right. Old business, Coakley, Landfill, Portsmouth City Council. <coughs> the Esquire um, has grabbed the floor, and, and I do want comments on that. Go ahead, Esquire. Certainly. Uh, on uh, your December 11th meeting, the board asked me for some uh, input, which I have given you uh, in the form of um, – confidential legal advice as to what steps could be taken in connection with uh, several disturbing developments that have occurred in connection with the uh, Coakley landfill. Uh, one of those disturbing developments has to do with the uh, lack of response by EPA and DES to uh, the uh, threat of to that we have experienced to our wells that Aquarian has that supplies us water with in which have uh, only this year found significant levels of PFCs. Uh, we have addressed that in part by engaging we and Northampton, the services of uh, Professor Tom Ballestero, who has uh, given some significant comments at their request to EPA and DES, explaining how it is that the Coakley landfill uh, does provide, because of the way it was utilized, a pathway for north and south migration of PFCs. His recommendation was that there be installed a number of couplet wells uh, to the south and southeast to detect whether or not PFCs, uh, which have been found at the Coakley landfill, are in fact migrating to the south and the southeast. Um, so far, it appears that EPA is not terribly uh, uh, proactive in that regard, and I think uh, it behooves any party that has a potential threat like that to put keep pressure on EPA and DES. Another problem has to do with the fact that uh, not only is there a, 
uh, slowness in terms of installing monitoring wells to the south and southeast. But in fact, uh, the Coakley Landfill Group has hired a lobbyist, uh, in fact, to, uh, who has indicated to Representative Bidney Mesmer that they oppose, they, that this lobbyist is going to oppose efforts on her part uh, to uh, uh, get properly gauge what is the, the level of PFCs that is acceptable in, wa in drinking water and moreover oppo to oppose legislation that would make the Coakley Landfill Group, which has a significant municipal membership, um, subject to the right to know law. So far, the Coakley Landfill Group has shown itself only when it feels it's, it's, it, to its interest. Uh, we, we had a presentation here by the Coakley Landfill Group, which was great, but uh, for the most part, they do their business behind closed doors. Um, and in response to this threat of a lobbyist to, to oppose legislation uh, aimed at the, uh, dealing with cancer uh, issues, um, the, uh, there was a presentation last week, last Monday, last uh, Tuesday, at the uh, Portsmouth City Council meeting by Representative Mesmer and also by Selectman Bean, uh, explaining uh, why there is a problem with the, with uh, hiring this lobbyist on the part of the Portsmouth City Council, and I believe it's important for this board to 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 have its voice heard in that same vein. And thus, I have prepared a letter uh, for the board's consideration uh, to voice our concerns. Uh, much of the city council in Portsmouth has new members. Uh, three of their former members have uh, retired. Uh, they have new members who do seem to be receptive to these concerns. A number of citizens, uh, besides the two I mentioned, did, did speak at that meeting uh, very eloquently as to why Portsmouth uh, should uh, act against uh, public health by providing 53 percent of the funding for a Coakley landfill group that's opposing uh, uh, public health, important public health measures. And so as a first step to what this board could do, I, I'm suggesting uh, that this letter be uh, sent to the Portsmouth City Council and signed by members of the board. I'd like to uh, jump in on this, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Uh, I request that it be put on the... Uh agenda. Uh, this was the meeting that I attended when you folks were down, at, some of you were down at, down at the beach with the governor, and uh, there, were, there was eloquent, eloquent testimony, uh, mostly from women, uh, that were uh, concerned, uh, number one, about the threat, uh, the carcinogens, but the fact that Portsmouth had a lobbyist and was lobbying against their own legislators and their own legislative efforts and their own ability to provide safe water, and in our case, safe and enough water. My comments to the, the council was that we in Hampton, both as a representative and a selectman, uh, were, t were tired of the obfuscation. We were tired of the obstruction. We were tired of these challenges that we face here in Hampton, and that uh, the conflict of interest uh, in, in all of those aforementioned phenomena, we're past that. And we're done dealing with the master of the universe and water and the solution that has failed for 30 years, Mr. Sullivan, the city attorney in Portsmouth and the CEO of the CLG. And the same transpires up to uh, Concord, where we went last Friday with the commission, of which I'm a member. The CLG was not there. They sent the lobbyist. Mr. McMahon, or Chairman McMahon, requested the, the lobbyist um, to answer some questions, if he could, and he refused to do so. And the CLG wasn't there. We have children dying. We have a cancer cluster, one of 300 in the country. Uh, DES came in at the very tail end of the meeting. They were not there. Health and Human Services uh, was not there. The EPA sent uh, a civil affairs uh, public affairs, Jim Murphy, and all, all of these men are honorable, and, and all of these, these state platforms are, are, uh, are hardworking, honorable people. Uh, but I was there, and I was in Portsmouth, and I wasn't getting supper, and I was being criticized, and uh, I was driving my hour and spending my time away from my job, and that's what I signed up to do and, pr and privileged to do it. 
but uh, is I made comment, specific comment, that the science wasn't there, uh, the the energy wasn't there, and that uh, it seems to be doing a backslide. And here we sit tonight in the town of Hampton. Uh, Portsmouth isn't aggrieved. They have plenty of water. Their water's safe. We've talked about this ad nauseum. And uh, I made comment additionally that we have Mr. Ballestero and that we have perhaps infrastructure uh, challenges that uh, Eversource can bring forth to mitigate this carcinogenic threat to our water supply that does not include uh, mixing a cancer cocktail and diluting uh, water uh, so the, the level lowers, uh, which to me is, is anachronistic and prehistoric and, and un unacceptable. So that's where we're at. It's not moving forward. Uh, and while I don't speak for the board, and my comments uh, indicated such in Portsmouth, and I don't speak for the commission, but I am a representative, it's time that Portsmouth started uh, accepting the responsibility, Mr. Chairman and board members, uh, for cost, to share in the cost of these, these uh, testing, to share in the cost of the remediation. And they've always dodged that. They took the attenuation route. Is that correct, Councillor? 30 correct. years ago, they put a Band-Aid on a melanoma. And now we're dealing with it. And we're the ones with the shutdown well. We're the ones that can't meet demand potentially. And here we sit, and nothing's changed. And it was a year ago. And now is the time to even reinforce this letter. Uh, I have read it. Uh, I do not believe that it asks for uh, indemnification on any part, does it? It does not. It does not. Why are we paying for Dr. Bellistero when they cannot disprove that they are responsible for these costs? Why are we going to pay higher infrastructure and uh, higher uh, capital investment cost as water consumers when Portsmouth isn't. And it's going to come on our rate for our wells. Why are we incurring these costs? Why are we spending our time? And they don't. And you saw what happened with the MBTE uh, allocation or disbursements most recently. And Portsmouth was right there. And they were, they were getting money to hook up people who they had impacted their wells. They were getting Lamprey River up in Madbury. And they were hooking themselves up. So. I think we need to be more aggressive. Uh, I think that Portsmouth needs to start paying some money. I think the time to um, talk with Mr. Sullivan is over. Uh, he doesn't speak. This is the city of Portsmouth. And this, this, this dishing off by Portsmouth over the last 30 years for people that don't attend meetings, that hire lobbyists, and leave us here alone. And I know, Mr. Chairman, uh, the quality of your leadership. And if the town of Hampton was polluting someone's water, or we couldn't disprove it, and they had a water shortage, I know you'd be on the phone to them. I know, you, I know you'd have the town manager on the phone to them. And I know this board would support that. And we don't hear anything from Portsmouth. We've never had a councilor come in here or pick up the phone and say, hey, Fred, what the heck's going on? You're almost out, you know, you're running a tight margin. Fred, you've got well shut down? Nothing, zip, zero, and they're our neighbors. And I know, I know the standard of different here in, in, in Hampton is different. And if there was something that we did, that we would be on the phone to them. And if there was a, a well or a pollution problem that we caused, we'd be looking for a much more aggressive remediation of that. Mr. McMahon, importantly, Chairman McMahon has called for the complete remediation and has the support with Minnie Messner and her great efforts to eradicate this problem and stop the testing, testing fish, is to make the problem go away. So I think this letter um, is great. I think it needs to allude that um, we shouldn't be paying for Dr. Ballastero. Northampton should be, and Portsmouth should be, and we should be in reimbursed for it. Further, the commission wants to hear from Dr. Ballastero, and we should have Dr. Ballastero provide science to the commission because there were no scientists there, and I made that point. We've got a, a, a public affairs gentleman from the EPA, and there wasn't one scientist in the room to testify, not one. You got an insurance guy and a bunch of other people. Messmer's a hydrologist, but with no expertise, no science in the room. And this, according to Attorney Sullivan, is going to go on and on. And we'll all die before um, it, it's resolved. So uh, if Mark would uh, incorporate some of those remarks I just had, I think the letter needs to be more aggressive. I think we need to be indemnified. And I think they, the city council, not Mr. Sullivan, City Council has to have membership up there, and they have to accept responsibility. The town of Northampton has to have membership in, in participation in these agreements. Because this, this Mr. Sullivan thing that we've all called out on a conflict of interest, obstruction, 
lack of transparency, conflict of interest, and now hiring a lobbyist, and not even showing up for the meeting, when we, we could run out of water, um, is the standard that this board uh, can no longer tolerate. And I would, I would invite the uh, um, counselor to uh, recommend a way forward. We did have a unanimous uh, consent several meetings ago that you were to pursue various courses of action. This is one, but I definitely think that it should be expanded. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So what do you need? Uh, I've given the board this letter as a yep. draft, and I'm open to the board's suggestions about whether you wish this letter to go out or you wish it to be modified. It's a board decision at this point. Okay, so do you need people to discuss that with you right now, or what? what? It can be done in a non-public session. Okay. so Probably best in that. Okay, way. good. So you don't need anything from us right now? You don't need a motion? You don't need anything right now? Uh, if the board wishes to discuss this in non-public, that's perfectly appropriate. That's no, I would prefer we're going, it. we're going after this meeting, right? Correct. Right, so you don't need anything at this time, though. That's what I'm asking, right now. That can be discussed at that time. Okay, good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. New business, 2018 town warrant for annual town meeting. Mr. Chairman, we have the three copies of the town warrant that uh, the board needs to sign to process the warrant to the deliberative session. Okay, do we need a, we've already voted on this. Mark, do they need to vote on this again? It's already, this is the approved everything, the final warrant. Do they need to vote or just sign it? I think it's appropriate to have so a vote. So probably best to do that. To this sign is the this. work that was completed by the board and all the warrant articles as well as everything from the budget committee um, in a final format. So if we've all seen it. We all had it in our packet. You we've do. all voted on this. We've I all read talked it. about I'll it. I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Okay. All in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Around. The other item you have there is the alarm system. This is a an item that is a minor housekeeping thing, but uh, was put forward by Christina. Uh, this issue came up in our office based on a complaint about charging for false alarms. In her review of the ordinance, she found that there was a section in there that. Um, She's recommended that we uh, delete subsection 542-4B. What that is is for unfounded emergency calls for the fire department for unfounded emergency fire calls. We don't do that. We don't charge that. This ordinance deals with the, the false police alarms. And when she went back and researched it from the very beginning, back in, I think it was 2003 when this was voted on, um, it was basically put in an error. Because it's in the ordinance, we could remove it as a Scribner's error, but to be abundance of caution, we would ask the board to recommend um, and vote to say motion to remove that section, and it'll clarify with what our practice is, what we do, and if the board wants to address doing that in the future, we can come back to you. But it's just a housekeeping issue. So you need a motion? Motion. I'll make a motion. Second. All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous? That is all. That is all. Uh, closing comments? Just one thing real quick. Uh, this Thursday is a question and answer for the wastewater treatment plan bond article at, is that the police training room? I'm sorry. At 6.30 Thursday. Is the Public Works is hosting a question and answer. 6.30 at the PD training station. If anyone is has any questions or any doubts about anything, please go and ask them. Okay. And I would like to, uh, for final comments, again, commend both Regina and I thought you did a, do a good job from what I read in the paper Thank with you. your comments at the uh, meeting. Rusty, I didn't get to see the thing, though, yet, so I'm sure you did a good job, too, because I didn't hear anything. I didn't say anything. Well, I went to listen. That's the best way to go. I went to listen to see what was going on. Yeah, I think a lot of people did. And, and I also commend Nancy Stiles. She... Uh, I saw the emails that she sent out asking people just to sit and listen. All right, so under 91-A colon 3-2-E, consideration or negotiation of pending claims of litigation which has been threatened in writing or filed by or against this board or any subdivision thereof or by or against any member thereof because of his or her membership therein until the claim of litigation has been fully educated are otherwise settled. Do I have a motion? That's the motion. Do I have a second? To go into non-public? Second. second by Rick. Roll call. Regina, Rusty, Rick, Phil, myself, unanimous. Thank you, Channel 22.